roughly speaking, this is the timeline of how we got to be where we are, where we're going. Uh, digital astronomy sort of really started around the 1980s, first with smaller digital detectors, and then moved onward into arrays from individual images to surveys, multiple surveys federated under a virtual observatory umbrella. And so 15 years ago, we had first foundational concrete and super virtual observatory. Five years ago, on first or conscious of mass informatics. And the field is growing, and it's been very vibrant and good. You can see that we're increasing our data volumes and data rates at the pace of about order of magnitude every five years, which is more as well. And as we move along, different kinds of tools and techniques begin to dominate our process of going from data to discovery. And so that means we have to keep learning all these new things. It started with simple image processing. Now we're talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence. And who knows where we'll go next. It'll be interesting to find out in another five years what will be beyond us for informatics. So this is probably the best definition of the big data that I've seen. Uh, astronomers have been doing big data for a while, and now our data are actually not so big compared to most of the others. Um, it's a big fad. All of the fields, not just of science, but human society, um, are coping with the need to actually cope with exponential growth of data driven by Moore's law. And in fact, I think pretty much all of the science today is on most astronomy is done behind a computer screen. I do nothing all day. I sit in front of my computer and everything is behind it. My data, other people's data, theories, papers, my colleagues, collaborators, and so on. And that's just the way that things are naturally work. So the focus has moved from uh, dealing with actual instruments, of course somebody still has to build it, to really dealing with bits, which is the real job of science. <coughs> So it's worthwhile, I think, looking at some of the very general trends that are affecting not just us, but other fields as well. The obvious one is the exponential data growth according to the Moore's Law, because that's the technology that gives them the data. And it's actually phenomenal if you think about it, that the data volume doubles every year and a half or so, meaning year and a half, we generate as much data as in all of the past history. But other fields are actually something moving faster, like bioinformatics. And so all of the sciences are now transitioning, or have transitioned already, from the old era of data poverty and subsistence to this exponential data block. And we're clearly not coping with it very well and being able to extract knowledge that's present in the data in an effective way. But what's really more interesting, to me at least, is not just data volumes and data rates, but data complexity, because that's where a lot of exciting stuff happens, and that's where all of the lot of actual problems there are, challenges. So the concept of data has been now changing. Data used to be fixed thing, you do it once, that's it, the published in a table, and nothing ever changes. But now, data are constantly changing, you're adding new ones, you're recalibrating, Slump the 10 data releases, and all of them have to be kept in order to be able to backtrack what's going on. And moreover, now again, thanks to the advent of cheaper and larger and better digital detectors, we have moved from panoramic photography of the sky to panoramic cinematography. And instead of dealing with data sets, we're now dealing with data streams. And because the streams are exponentially growing too, we have to do them pretty much in real time. Otherwise, we're not catch up. Another aspect that kind of became obvious during well, creation of virtual observatory is that we transition from centralized places where we have access to the data, usually observatory, to distributed communities and resources that have to be connected to some issue. And the thing that became so overabundant uh, that ownership or even access to the data are no longer very important. But what really matters, really what should matter, is the ownership of the expertise and creativity needed to extract knowledge from the data. 
my own institution uh, was basically using a business model whereby access, privilege access to the large telescope is the way to achieve greatness in astronomy. And I think that era is now well and truly over. Uh, now, anybody with internet connection can do excellent science, and it's only going to get more so. So, another thing that's sometimes not fully appreciated, I think, is that theory has underwent even more fundamental transformation than observations. That now a lot of theory is done through numerical simulations of ever higher quality, and now the output of theory is no longer a formula, but the data set. And so those theoretical data have to be analyzed, mined in the same way as observational data, and they have to be confronted. We just don't have terribly good ways of doing that without losing information. So this, this, I think, is a really profound intellectual shift. That numerics are no longer just subsidiary <coughs> analytical theory of thinking. They're really as fundamental as analytical uh, theory because some things cannot be done analytically a priori. So the astronomical community came up with the framework of virtual observatory about 15 years ago. It was our response, community response to the challenges and opportunities that we had given by the exponential data growth. And a bunch of other communities did the same. Um, virtual scientific organization became older age. Amazingly enough, virtual observatory was seen as one of the better. And this was an interesting phenomenon because it was a new kind of a scientific organization that some funding agencies didn't know how to deal with because they were not based in a given institution or, or building or anything, but actually they're based in a community or a scientific domain. And that posed all manner of challenges for management and funding and whatnot. And some of those some of those problems are actually responsible for less than fully efficient return that we have. But the interesting part about these organizations that they're clearly always driven by the exponential data growth is that they have to be very agile. They have to be evolving on the same time scales. And if they fail to do so, they very quickly fail in delivering what they're supposed to and become, well, maybe not relevant, but not very important or effective. And I think that's exactly what happened in astronomy. So, I think now, thanks to the travel of coming agencies, the era of virtual observatory is truly well over. Uh, we still have such organizations, and there is a law which serves as a good way for excuse for people to travel to different places. Um, but, at least in the US, I think man, most other places, Virtual observatories are now in their sunset and they're being replaced by coordination offices of different kind, which is exactly what should happen. And we're moving into the direction of broader community inclusion through astroinformatics. But the virtual observatory has done us a lot of good. And to my never ending amazement, it is seen as the poster child of the cyber infrastructure movement and virtual scientific organizations which is horrifying if, you, if you've been there and making sausage from the beginning, um, but it actually is true. We're like way ahead of most other fields. We got the rock together. And it facilitated science with massive complex data. It also empowered a larger community to do first-rate observational science. Now it can be observer without ever going to a telescope, and it will publish papers purely on the basis of data analytics phenomenology. So virtual observatory, even though I always kept criticizing and why we're not doing this or that, has done us a lot of good and would be at the enemy of most other fields. What what VIO has not done and what many of us keep saying we have to do this is to produce and deploy better knowledge extraction tools. Because that is where actually science happens. You can build the best infrastructure in the world, which, if it's good, is invisible, and therefore not appreciated and take it for granted. But until there are scientific results, the community will not take it up. And so it's a vicious circle. If there is no uptake, there is no results. If there is no results, there is no uptake. And 
Now we say, rest in peace, virtual tour. So what about Vascular Informatics? Well, before we go there, it's worthwhile, I think, asking the question, well, it was a success, really? Okay, so why did that happen? Well, we were in a very fortunate position that there were several factors that got together at around the same time that led to this. And first of all, scholars have been always data savvy and getting this data in digital form and using computers from the get-go. And so the community was well prepped and qualified to move in this direction. We even realized that we had to standardize that FITS standard was really quite ahead of its time, but still using it. Um, the second trend was that agencies like NASA mandated that most of the large data collections are in publicly accessible archives, and that kind of prepped the community to think in that way. Um, and so that established this culture of data sharing. And I remember when people are thinking of proprietary periods as this invention of the devil, you know, communism or something. Um, but very quickly people realized that it's good to be able to share your data because then you know, it's a mutual uh, benefit for everyone. So the community actually got the, its act together responding to the challenges of exponential data growth and amazingly enough, the two main funding agencies in the US uh, for astronomy, NASA and NSF, also got NSF more than NASA, but they actually put money up for this. And that's another thing that people pay attention to in addition to scientific results, they pay attention to funds. And so the whole thing just went straight along. But I think something that we should always keep in mind is that we're also in an extremely privileged position that our data have no commercial value, as Jim Drake put it nicely, they're worthless, and they have no privacy concerns. <coughs> so that is holding back uh, fields like biomedical informatics in really fundamental fashion. So in the last five years or so, um, ten years, there's been a rise of these ex-informatics, probably bioinformatics leading the way, but and geo and astroinformatics and so on. And these are seen as these bridge fields between applied computer science, computing te information technology, and domains like astronomy or biology. And uh, the key point here is that instead of being just the providence of a small group of experts, this is meant to be all inclusive, the, the broaden participation of the community, both as consumers and as contributors to it. And it's also giving us the common vocabulary um, that we can actually talk to people from other fields and uh, hopefully exchange ideas and gain from each other, borrowing different solutions. In the same way that mathematics and statistics are universal languages of science, so is computing. And so that, I think, is a very good thing because all the interesting problems today are not to this So something I like to drum about forever, I think, because it's important, is I think the best way to look at what virtual observatory and astro informatics and data what are all about is to think in terms of systematic exploration of parameter spaces, and by, by which I mean color. So there are different kinds of parameter spaces. And the first, there is parameter space of observations. Every observation carves a hyper volume in terms of area coverage, depth, blocks, flavor, resolution, and so on. And uh, the more volume you cover in the parameter space, the higher chances you have in finding interesting things. Uh, usually that happened when new wavelength regimes were opened up, but also angular resolution, and so on. So this is a good framework within which you can look strategically as to what are we covering and what we're not covering, and therefore think, where might new things be? Um, and for example, today, time domain, which is a whole bunch of different axes, uh, is all the rage. So this, will, this describes observations. Once you get to observations, you discover you know, kind of objects, stars, galaxies, whatever, you measure their properties, and that creates a new parameter space, parameter space of measurements. In some cases, you can do science right there, like here is a famous example, using color space to discover quasars, which is now being done in industrial fashion, with Sloan survey, others. Um, but sometimes you actually have to 
convert those measured quantities into physical quantities and then you find even more interesting things like various correlations and clustering that mean something and so on. Uh, a good way to explain this I found is to look at HR diagram, which is a two-dimensional parameter space of luminosity and temperature for stars and stars for these one-dimensional sequences in it that don't fill up the space. And so when you take this data, combine it with additional data like distances and theory, you essentially have arena that, uh, for exploration of stellar physics and evolution. So now think of not two dimensions, but tens of dimensions, and so you can see there is a huge scientific potential if only we knew how to do this right in many dimensions. So the, these parameter spaces are not uniformly filled or randomly filled. You know, things group because there's some laws of nature that tell them where to go. And wherever you have dimensionality reduction like that, uh, you have correlations, and correlations usually reflect some phenomenon. And, you know, like Stolly Fisher relation, for example, or main sequence, and so on. And that's where all the size comes from. So that basically means that machine learning and applied statistics to machine learning are the key technologies and methodologies for virtual observatory, in fact, most of the data rich science. Because a lot of problems can be expressed as in this language of parameter spaces. And things you can do is you look for patterns which can be correlations and clusters and anomalies and outliers and gaps and so on. And there is always a reason why there are such things. Uh, and the tools to do this are through machine learning of different sorts. Now, this is actually real data. These are quasars in eight dimensional color space, but that's another story. Um, and so you have some real knowledge is required in order to do this right. You have to know what algorithms to choose, what kind of data models to apply. You have to worry about incompleteness and bad data and clean data and so on. <clears throat> they have to, to reduce the dimensionality of these problems because most algorithms don't scale very well with dimensionalities, like a power of dimensionality of some sort. And so you want to reduce it to the minimum number of important parameters that contain most, if not all, of the information and simple things like principal component or analysis or something like that usually don't work because things are complicated. And so there are many more sophisticated ways by which one can do this. And the technical challenges in actually doing this usually fall in two groups. The scalability of algorithms, uh, which can be with the number of data vectors and also with the number of dimensions. Number of data vectors is really easy, it's n log n or something like that but the dimensionality is harder, and that's where a lot of applied computer science research has to happen. And then also visualization. Both of those are aggravated by high dimensionality. So a generic problem that you can think of is that, and this applies in every field, you can you have some parameter space, I'm here sketching 3D cube, but thinking in terms of 300 or 3,000 dimensional hypercube. And most things can be just distributed in some noisy fashion randomly, but somewhere in some subset projection of dimensions and subset portion of the hyper volume, there is something different. And I'm deliberately using these vague words because it could be cluster, it could be correlation, it could be something like that. And how do you systematically sift without prejudice through such huge parameter spaces? to effectively find these spots where there is entropy reduction. That's an open problem. You know not how to do this. You can do it in brute force, but usually it will take forever. Um, and so that's a very interesting and general question for all of the, all of the data science. Another important and general question is <coughs> model uncertainty. By models, I mean both data models and theoretical numerical models. And there is always uncertainties from all these things like measurement errors, numerical <coughs> ground of errors, and so on, but also more subtle things that have to do with the choices of algorithms, uh, with the way you analyze the data, uh, how you represent them, and so on and so forth. And there is no established formal framework to really deal with this. So this is one of the projects, for instance, 
starting to think about with some of the bright computer scientists at Caltech, uh, that be good to establish a, at least set of practices or guidelines, if not a rigorous theory, how to really estimate uncertainties of all these data mining processes um, when things are much more complicated than what you do with normal error propagation in formula. And just as an illustration here, uh, you look at climate model predictions, which notoriously are uh, controversial, and usually what people do is they run a whole bunch of simulations or models, and they use the highest and the lowest, and they call it just the uncertainty band, but that's just not very satisfying. And you, first of all, you don't guarantee that you actually put everything in a, in, into account, but this particular example is probably the most important scientific question of our text. And it's the lack of confidence in our predictions of what will happen that is really feeding all the political attacks. There. Another important thing that affects all of the data science is visualization. And visualization is crucial for many reasons. First of all, it's the only way in which you can actually understand intuitively what's going on. So it's the bridge between quantitative and content of the data and your understanding. You can stare at tables of numbers all you want and you never grasp what's going on. But having properly visualized and your pattern recognition engine in your head you can already make some discoveries. And philosophers have been always saying this. So this is actually a highly non-trivial problem because 3D is easy but what if you have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of dimensions? Well, then you're truly out of luck. Now, there is no reason why nature should be so simple to have laws of nature always project to, say, three dimensions or something like that. It could be 300 dimensional laws of nature. And it will be very difficult to grasp and understand and see what the context is and so on. And so there are various tricks by which we can represent effectively maybe a dozen dimensions of parameter spaces in pseudo 3D plot and uh, Chiro Donnelly will be talking about this later in the conference but that's not easy and so usually projections of high dimensional spaces to lower dimensional spaces smear all the information think of it just like histograms right and sometimes there is irreducible information present in multiple dimensions and so that I think is going to be one of the he is already one of the key bottlenecks for all the data rich science that we are unable to understand what we see in many dimensions in the data. So, in fact, that kind of leads to this very general statement you know, what's the science really all about? And its purpose is to replace all this messy phenomenology of the world with some relatively simple rules that will always apply and that explains the broad range of phenomena. So Newton's gravity formula applies to apples and the moon and galaxies, and there is real understanding there why this happens, so you don't have to always kind of describe a plant as this and apple as that, right? So there's actually real law of nature behind it. So what do you do when those laws of nature are too complex for human mind to grasp? We can give up, right? But that's not a good solution. And so this is why we increasingly have to incorporate machine learning and machine intelligence in our uh, scientific investigation. So we're already doing that through a variety of machine learning tools in classification and what have you. But I think where this is really going is truly collaborative human computer scientific discovery, where your machine intelligence friends can guide you and find interesting things but it will always fall on human scientists to understand what's really going on. And these two thinkers were really saying this for many years ago. Vannevar Bush was talking about future in which man-made machines will start to think, and J.C.R. Licklear, who's less well-known, but he's the man to whom we have to thank for the existence of internet, uh, wrote papers of man machine symbiosis four or fifty years ago. They just didn't have the technology to do it. Now we do. In 
fact, you probably have machine intelligence in your pocket. Um, but this is going to be a very interesting qualitative shift in the way we do science. A simple example uh, that we've done, that Martin Graham may talk about later, is using so-called symbolic regression, which is a method whereby you give computer a library of mathematical functions, arithmetical, three vowels, whatever, constants, <coughs> and unleash it on some highly multidimensional data set. And the computer finds mathematical relationships that describe your data without really knowing anything about what the data these data are. Uh, and we tested it. We can rediscover the HR main sequence and HR diagram, can rediscover fundamental plane, and then we apply it to classify variable stars and perform as good or better as most of other things that we've seen. So this is, I think, a good example of really machine-assisted discovery is that computer draws your attention to possible regularities that you then have to interpret in intuitive sense, do they make sense or not. Which then actually, I think, kind of completes the picture. Why is this really new and different? What the support paradigm is all about? And there are really these three main differences from traditional science. Having more and more complex data is not just having more data. It really enables you to discover extremely rare and unusual things that you otherwise would have no chance of finding. So informational content of the data is so high that it enables a lot of profitable data mining, diamonds in the dust. Um, data fusion reveals new knowledge that you cannot see in any separate data set but together it pops up, usually multi-wavelength uh, approaches to what we've seen that in astronomy. And then there's this more subtle and to me more interesting question of how do you actually have to deploy machine intelligence to help human scientists discover stuff. So those three things is really what makes this data science or fourth paradigm science new and different. So if we're all dealing with the same kind of problems uh, in different fields, then naturally you think, well, can we reuse solutions from one field in another and save ourselves a lot of trouble? And essentially we're all trying to develop new parts of the scientific method for the 21st century. And uh, can we do this in, in a way that actually makes sense? So to this effect, um, we now have this new center at Caltech called Center for Data Driven Discovery which operates in, a close, in close partnership with its counterpart, the JBL. And the goals are both to facilitate data-rich science in different fields, but more importantly to serve as this connecting, catalyzer, melting pot, and corporate memory of the ideas that can be maybe reused from one field to another and save a lot of time and trouble uh, in reinventing them. So as we've done a bunch of these things. Um, Aaron Golden, who actually was trained as an astronomer at the University of Washington and then became bioinformatician, came up with this parallel between virtual observatory and genomics, where he outlined how, in fact, there is a parallel structure of going from raw data into data that are more suitable for scientific discovery. And we wrote this little essay for the genomics journal. For one month, this was like the most downloaded paper they had. And it was just like a little hand wavy thing, like, well, you can do this, right? And so that community, I think, is primed for organizing themselves more along the line of virtual observatory. Um, we're now applying some of the, the same lore in earth science or geophysics. Ashish Mahabal will uh, be working with our JPL colleagues on this. So EarthCube is a massive NSF project to really organize geosciences approach to data in the same way that astronomers organize themselves into the virtual observatory. And there is a lot of reuse of cyber infrastructure solutions and methods that work on that. Our JPL friends, and primarily Ben Crichton and Chris Mackman, have been developing a system called ODP, which stands for Object Oriented Data Technology. And it's an open source machinery available through Apache Foundation that can be used to essentially create 
major data systems, virtual security like systems in any field, and it's been applied in a broad range of different things, starting with space science, obviously, but now going into medicine and geology and all kinds of other stuff, and really demonstrating how there really could be a common data infrastructure that people don't have to reinvent, but can actually download Apache and just turn it in, more or less works. And so that's been uh, well regarded and, and really appreciated by many people. Another interesting project with JPL is uh, Early Detection Research Network, which is work sponsored by the National Cancer Institute that tries to establish the old kind of structure uh, for cancer research, biomarker research in cancer. Again, Dan Kraken's been leading that effort, and she's just uh, deeply involved in it, and he will talk about this kind of stuff later in the meeting. There are other things. Like, for example, you know that time domain astronomy now is all the rage, and we're thinking in terms of systemic approaches that you detect transients in the sky, then you have to classify them, characterize them, follow them up in presence of limited resources, some are more interesting than others, and so on. You have to make automated decision making. Well, similar things are now happening in, in seismology, where my colleagues, Rob Clayton, Julian Bann, and others, are using cell phones as earthquake detectors. Uh, any one of them has an accelerometer, any one of them is too noisy, but if you have lots and lots of cell phones, you can average their signals and have better estimates of seismic activity than the normal seismograph network in California. And then you can send alerts, because there is a finite speed of propagation on these waves, and so on. Similar things can now be uh, thought of in the rising field of personalized medicine, or people talking about you know, having sensors associated with your cell phone that monitor your health and that can sense if you're about to have a heart attack and give you proper alert or call the ambulance or something like that. So there is a lot of exciting stuff where real-time data mining that we're learning to do in astronomy may be applicable in other fields and sometimes maybe even save human lives. One project that we've been working on in different ways is collaborating with neurobiologists at Caltech. And they're studying autism. So they use two different kinds of data. There, there are sort of <coughs> clinical data, there are essentially questionnaires that patients have to fill, doctors have to fill, and there are MRI scans, and we started with the simpler stuff. And so there are these questionnaires that may have several hundred different questions of different doctors and methods and so on. They, they score them in a very simple minded fashion. And so we apply some simple tools, like we find out which of these actually matter. Right? And we found out that no more than half a dozen questions are enough to have a nearly perfect diagnosis of autism um, and not even bother with all the rest. And so this is a very feature selection of algorithm that we go down to some manageable number, like six or so. This is a plot that you have done many. Where you encode different parameters to positions, color, shape, sizes, textures, and so on. And you can actually see that there are dividing surfaces that separate people with diagnosis one versus the other. And sometimes you see there is an outlier, something wrong with, with that particular person or that measurement. Um, and so that's a very straightforward application of the stuff we've been doing. But it's already possibly the best diagnosis for autism ever. Matthew applied his toy, toys of uh, logical regression, mm -hmm. symbolic regression, also to do the classification and found spectacular results. But we're still somewhat limited in, in the data sets available. But that too is a completely different approach that neurobiologists have never heard of before. And because we learned how to do it for astronomy, now we can actually apply it on neurobiology data. And finally, the visualization. We've been working on uh, using virtual reality platforms for data visualization for a number of years now. And that's moving on along very well. This is something that every field will need. Chiro, Dominic, again, will report on this later in the meeting. Uh, 
So I think this is, this is sort of opening up really powerful new ways to really wrap your intuition around highly dimensional data distributions and data constructs. And we are not been slouching on, on how to train the new generation. So along with our JPL friends, we made the well, first virtual summer school on big data analytics, which today has been uh, accessed by over 22,000 students. And it's so freely available on Coursera. But, you know, we'll be adding more stuff to it. And so everybody has this problem of students don't know this kind of stuff for the simple reason that professors know even less. And so we have to provide them with the ways of learning these skills for research in the 21st century. So here is a list of some of, I think, their important challenges which can serve as good departure points for discussions in this meeting. And this list has been distressingly constant over the last several years. We're still struggling with the same old things, dealing not just with technical issues of machine learning, visualization, or what have you, but more and more with sociological issues of community uptake, acceptance, proper career paths for people who know how to do this kind of stuff, um, how do we actually teach the students, and so on. So um, I thought I would then just end with this. I'll just put up some words of wisdom by different points. And I'll take questions. Thank you.